I know Brie Larson wasn't too keen on honkies talking about her movie, but don't shoot. I'm black. Ah! Captain Marvel is the 21st movie in a franchise that was stale 17 movies ago. You take that back! And it's directed by Jack Saint and his wife. It's about an incredibly powerful and adept young woman with amnesia pursuing her lost memories to defeat an invasive villain who can appear as anyone. My verdict? Alita Battle Angel was pretty alright. Well done, Spy Kids guy, Cameron. On the first alright anime movie out of Hollywood. No, this was based on a novel of a different name. And what a coincidence for two movies with so many broad similarities to release so close together and become spearheads in the public dialogue. Ooh. So why not a little side-by-side -side comparison to see what worked? Alita. And what didn't? Marvel. There will be major spoilers ahead for both movies, so if you want my recommendations first, see a lot of Alita and skip Sponge Pants Squarehead. Is that like a personal attack or something? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I haven't read either source material, so when I say Alita is alright, my opinion of it as an adaptation is still pending. When I say Captain Marvel is a giant yawn, I mean, what fucking comic am I even supposed to start with? The original ones where she's a dude? No thanks. Marvel begins with the protagonist waking up on some alien planet. She's troubled by her dreams, which are memories of her past life as Carol Danvers, an Earth-born US fighter pilot. Carol has inconvenient amnesia though, so she thinks she's Kree, a species that conveniently looks, acts, and functionally are human, except they have blue blood. Oh Jesus. She's also conveniently impervious, so she can't get a paper cut and ruin the illusion. Carol goes to spar with her mentor, Jan Rog, who's teaching her to keep her emotions in check. Such a hot ed. Except this is a bit silly because there's never been a character more amazing at being unfazed by everything for two hours. Bree spent nine months perfecting that stony expression. And nine months well spent. After too much dialogue of characters expositing shit they should already know, Yon Law, Carol, and some other Kree warriors head off to hunt some Skrull commander named Talos, principal member of an allegedly hostile shapeshifter race. The Kree fuck up and the scrolls take Carol to sift through her memories in search of some lady named Dr. Wendy Lawson, whom Carol knew but had forgotten. This is also a bit silly because these memories blatantly reveal Carol is an earthling, yet it takes her another hour to catch up. Carol easily escapes the scrolls with her photon blasting powers, making snarky quips and brushing off scrolls all the merry way. She flees in a pod that crumbles and plummets her to earth, where she smashes into a blockbuster. This all takes about 20 to 25 minutes. What this opening does well, it quickly establishes the goal for Carol, which is to hunt down Dr. Lawson's shit before the scrolls do. The uh, memory interrogation sequence was uh, cool when it wasn't dumb. That's it. What this opening does poorly. A lot of what we're shown misleads us for the twist in the last third of the film. As it turns out, the scrolls that are just perfectly designed for invading planets and that have been shooting at and zapping Carol and attempting to murder humans were beautiful, innocent angels all along. So the opening is retroactively made that much sillier. Exposition is heavy and there's nothing in universe excusing it. Not even the amnesia. They wanted to set up the whole Kree civilization and the war with the scrolls as fast as possible. Can't say they didn't. What the opening does the worst is fail to establish Carol as a character. They give her a concrete goal, which, you know, good job, well done. But they forego giving her the motive to strive for it. Why does she want to stop the scrolls beyond being told to? What does she want from all this, personally? Does she want to make up for all the suffering she's caused? Does she want to be king? Does she want to be jacked? It can't be just standing up to her daddy and the rest of the evil bad flashback men. They're not on screen for longer than seconds each. It can't be standing up to Yon Law. She's friendly with him for most of the runtime. The best answer I have is she wants to make sense of her memories, which is... Bullshit! What the fuck? She sat on that for about six years and has such an underwhelming reaction when Talos confirms they're not just dreams. So I'm not really feeling an impassioned drive here. It's precisely this lack of drive, which is why the scrolls have to take Carol, move her to Earth, and force her to jump to it. If it had been left up to her, the movie never would have happened. What a bore. So how about Alita's opening? We begin with a scavenging Dr. Ito chancing upon Alita's core in the scrapyard underneath the floating city of Zalem. 
He takes her home and gives her a robot body to work with, and when she wakes up, she has no idea who she is or where she's from. For a while, she's just happy to be with Ido, to play motorball with the neighborhood punks, and to learn about the world around her. It's not until she follows Ido into an alleyway one night that she discovers he hunts ne'er-do-wells for money. As it happens, he was lured into a trap that fateful night, so Alita unlocks her combat prowess and even some memories and saves Ido. This all clocks in at about half an hour. What this opening does well, there's some fair world building. Above all, it's done naturally. Alita is the classic fish out of water, so we have plenty of expository dialogue explaining Iron City, Salem, Motorball, and Centurions. Now normally I'd whine about all this memory loss because it's the laziest way to manufacture conflict for a character, and the criteria for resolving it tends to be wishy-washy at best. But if you're going to utilize this plot device, I think the way Alita Battle Angel does it is much better than Captain Marvel, at least. Alita doesn't have six years in a job as a space ranger to cushion her amnesia, so we get to experience Iron City and step with her. What this opening does, not as well. Alita's character is, on the flip side, kind of formless for a while. Her excitement to learn about Iron City is contagious, but until her suspicions toward Ido take root, there's not that much going on with her besides being a cutie little patootie. I find this forgivable since there really is a lot of world building to get out of the way, and it's much much cooler than generic alien world and 90s nostalgia baiting. That's it. That said as well, it's a shame how painfully rushed Alita's pacing becomes from here on. I've got some questions for these movies. We'll start with Captain Marvel. Why do the Kree want to genocide the Skrulls so badly if the Skrulls didn't do nothing? It can be as simple as the Kree are evil, but why make a point of giving us the wrong answer to that question and, you know, not the real one? What were the Kree doing with Carol? They weren't trying to weaponize her photon energy to use for themselves. They were training her to contain it. They weren't using her to find the Tesseract, or at least not while parading her in front of their enemy, power limited and vulnerable during Star Force missions for years. All I got is that the Kree realized they accidentally created an invincible immortal goddess. So they figured the only way to prevent retaliation was by tricking her and taking her to their home and making her intimately familiar with their command structure. Okay. Why was the Supreme Intelligence using Marvel's likeness to Carol? The Kree are aware she doesn't remember who Marvel is, and that if when she does, their jig is up. Does the Supreme Intelligence have no choice but to use the most important person to Carol? Doesn't sound so supreme to me. Why were Carol's memories wrong? She remembers a scroll killing Marvel, even when the scrolls were examining the scene in her head. Supposing the Kree manipulated her memories, I'm guessing they were the ones who wiped most of them too? Yet they left some behind edited, whether uh, naturally or artificially? Why not all edited or all wiped? How come Talos didn't know to bring Carol to his side when he had her in the memory machine? Hey Toots, here are your memories and uh, would you look at that, we have the same enemy. Truce? They make it out like he didn't know enough at the time, but that doesn't line up. He must have known her memory of the Skrulls killing Marvel wasn't real, and he had to have known Carol was not Kree, yet he didn't even try to reason with her. Instead, he did nearly everything possible to be the bad guy. Since, well, fuck, he is the bad guy. Until the movie changes its mind. While the scrolls failed, I repeat, failed to get the coordinates of the MacGuffin, they did confirm Dr. Wendy Lawson was on Earth, and that they were on their way. We're on our way. The fuck you mean on your way? They are there. And they already knew Lawson was from Earth, right? Talos has assumed the post of S.H.I.E.L.D. director for a little while now. It's not something he managed in under 12 hours of fire. Finding Earth, right? Why a light speed engine as the MacGuffin when all these alien fucks are warping everywhere anyway? How did Fury find Carol at the bar? And just as she got there, Carol interrogates Fury to see if he's really Fury. You don't think a scroll could BS the life story of a guy you've known for like two minutes? There's randomly an alien cat wandering the halls of this classified facility. So S.H.I.E.L.D., with its alien director, mind you, does already know about and shelter aliens? Maybe? 
Was Fury too low level to get the memo? Why the fuck did Carol accept Talos' side of things so easily after his guys have spent the movie shooting at her? Talos himself even tried to kill Fury. At some point, even if Talos had his reasons, you gotta draw a line, right? Like, damn. Maybe I missed something here. But why does Talos beg Carol to decode the coordinates he shouldn't have? When did he get those between the memory machine scene and this scene? Why make Nick Fury into a complete fucking joke? And I don't remember this OP cat in any of the other MCU movies. I know this is a complaint in like every other one of these movies. The why didn't X show up to help stop this world ending threat? Question. But. Right. Army. You don't think it might have been an excellent time to page Carol? Just saying. All right, for the good of mankind, we're set to nuke New York City. Unless you have some fantastical godsend who can wipe out alien fleets in a literal flash or something. If you don't have something that goddamn incredible in your goddamn pocket, it's bye bye New York. They deserve to die and I hope they burn in hell! My questions for Alita are, why is a white guy named Ido? Now I like Mr. Walsh's performance a lot, and the man has wonderful on-screen presence with waifus. Are you engaged? We'll discuss it later, okay? <laughs> but Ido? Well, I looked into it and yeah, the original character is pretty much a blonde German. So this is only the adaptation being faithful, apart from changing the first name from Daisuke to Dyson, which makes absolute sense to me. You know what? I'm going to retract this question. I wouldn't have done it any different. What was that war between Earth and Mars all about? Was Earth the bad guy because of Nova? I get the dude set up himself as a kind of god lording over Zalem and Iron City. So in doing that, did he drag Mars into a conflict? That really needed answering sooner rather than later. But eh, we know Alita doesn't have all of her memories back and at least she already has concrete reasons to despise and want to take down Nova without having the full backstory yet. Does Vector not know who Ido is despite his partner being Ido's ex-wife? and his underling tussling with Ido twice? If he does, then why ignore him? Find Ido, find Alita, like he wants, right? Or why not find her through Hugo? Why this harebrained scheme where Vector dangles entry to Zalem over Hugo, which somehow translates to Alita entering the motorball tryouts to kill her there? I'd understand all this hoop jumping if Vector or Nova couldn't find Alita, but at no point in the movie am I led to believe they couldn't effortlessly do just that anytime. Why in the world did Alita have her boyfriend's head isis off. Okay, so because she humiliated this hunter warrior named Zapan, uh, Zappin? He mortally wounds her much more mortal boyfriend in front of her. Due to some monumental bullshit, Hugo is framed as a criminal, so by law, the kill must be finished. If Alita impedes that, the Centurions will kill her and Hugo both. Cheaper still, Alita just happens to have a master surgeon arrive on scene to slice off Hugo's head and connect it to her heart, which somehow keeps the head alive. Alita then pretends Hugo's decapitation killed him, except a Centurion scan confirms he was killed. Is it only looking looking for Hugo's heart or something in cyborg land. And if that wasn't bad enough, just a couple short scenes later, Alita angrily marches into Hunter Warrior HQ and guess what she does? Takes out a slew of centurions with ease. She unscrewed her boyfriend's head from his body for nothing. Terrible setup, terrible execution. When's Alita 2? The winner is Alita. I liked Alita's action quite a bit. It's rated PG-13, yet we still got Alita punching a splicer to death, leaving his head a bloody blue pulp. We got Alita nailing a hose head to the wall with her foot, stabbing a robot dude with a robot arm. Just a lot of puncturing. It's great. The violence has weight to it. Even Alita sustained some significant damage at one point. Captain Marvel is also PG-13 and the action sucks. There's no weight to the violence. Very little blood, no puncturing. No! Just Carol playing whack a scroll with her invincible bad self. The ending battle is so boring. Carol just flies around like she's a light projection herself with no chance of being touched and blasts everything away with her lame ass beam powers. It could have been, you know, okay if it were really such a level up, but it's not like Carol could ever get hurt anyway. By the end, she could just light shit up more and fly. Speaking of being an overpowered bitch. 
Carol and Alita are Mary Sue's. There, I said it, sue me. But they're not equal. First, Carol. There's the usual stuff. She's invincible with enhanced strength and has no weaknesses to her powers. To be fair, all that can be levied against a couple other Marvel heroes to a degree, but they weren't doing the cringy eyebrow arch thing before sassing their enemies. Plus, Carol's flat. I mean, as a character. Cap and Thor still had character arcs, with Cap coming into his own as a super soldier, and Thor overcoming his ego to be worthy to wield the hammer again. But Carol starts her movie needing to overcome her impulsiveness in using her powers, then spends the movie not being hampered by it at all, and ends the movie realizing, wait, no, actually, her powers are too awesome to contain. Who? Who to me? You can beat me with no self-reflection and no overcoming any character flaw because her one shortcoming is actually her best feature. There is no arc, just the arch. There's even a scene to mimic Rey and Luke in the tree. Fury asks Carol why she's here. Stop the scrolls before they become unstoppable. So Fury answers for her. I know a rogue soldier when I see one. I've got a personal stake in this. Something inside me has always been there. Sure, Carol's curious about her memories of being on Earth, but curious is about as desperate as she gets. She acts so aloof and unaffected so much of the time that you have to wonder if she does care. She turns back to save Fury when it counts, so she cares about him, I guess, but she's known him for all of an hour. Their connection is just incidental and convenient. And when the twist happens, Carol almost immediately sides with the scrolls and is smiling and yucking it up minutes later. <laughs> It doesn't matter that she'd be loyal anyway. When everyone adores her, Fury loves her, the bad guys end up loving her. Like, damn, her pilot friend gives her a speech about how marvelous she is. But maybe with the exception of Fury, they don't really admire her for what she does, just who she is. What Carol has inside of her, is much more valuable than what she's doing for the majority of the movie. The scrolls want her because she has the location of the MacGuffin stored in her head. The humans want her because otherwise they really have no fucking clue what's going on. And the Kree want her because, well, they want her. Toward the movie's end, Carol's actions matter a lot more as she enters the Marvel Tar state and starts shredding an alien fleet like paper by removing the power limiter. The only things holding her back were aliens lying to her, men telling her the truth, and a rinky dink neck pod device. No inherent physical limitations, no antagonistic force that at least at one point is more powerful than she. An anime power limiter. Okay, what about Alita? At first, Alita is probably suier than Carol, a slightly blanker slate to self-insert into. She's amazing at everything she sits out to do, because she was some kick-ass Martian soldier in her past life, and now just about everybody loves her upon meeting her. Who couldn't? I could stare into those freakish bush baby eyes forever. And she saved a puppy! Aww. But as the minutes tick by, Alita takes shape as a real person. She comes to love Ito like a father, yet goes against his wishes to become a hunter warrior so that she can unlock more of her memories. She falls in love with Hugo, a little too hard, to the point that she's literally shoving her heart in his face. Her fanciful interest in Motorball becomes so much more, transforming into a means of helping her man reach Zalem, and then to a means of revenge. Alita's power level does reach Supermensch, but it doesn't stop her from losing Hugo, and by the end, Alita's not smiling anymore. She wants to reach Zalem and destroy it. This Martian cyborg girl feels so much more human than the alien who was human. I'm not saying Alita's arc is perfect, by the way. The switch from naive girl pleading with a bar full of bounty hunters to street smart hard ass mocking and knocking heads in a bar is packed into like a minute. Hold on there, death row. My verdict? Alita is probably only a Mary Sue to start and works her way up to honorary stew status. Carol, however, a Marvel Sue. Duh.
Alita doesn't really have haha -ha comedy. So I'm including this section to harp on wannabe guardians of the galaxy over here. No, Marvel comedy in general. What I call Marvel comedy consists of two jokes. One I'll call Stark Snark, where characters fancy themselves comedians and spout off witty lines. You'll never You never what? You didn't finish! Got tired of shooting golf? Well, I played 18. Shot 18. This can't seem to miss. And the others when they undercut a tense and or dramatic scene by going, Psych! Haha, we almost got serious for a second. Stop. And the snark will often combine with the tone death to make the ultimate haha -ha funny. Your haircut? Notice you've copied my beard? It worked with Tony because there's the dissonance of being simultaneously a noble hero and an arrogant genius playboy snarking it up. But then everyone became Black Widow. I really don't want to hurt you. I wouldn't stress about it. <gasps> Did I step on your moment? Why don't you start roaming off my dick? And Carol Danvers wastes no time hopping on that train. You guys wouldn't happen to know how these things come off, would you? No? Stop. Does Joss Whedon regularly burst into the writing room like Where's the sauce? When Alita got snarky, at least it was with some preening faggot who was asking for it. Not great, but it isn't painful. And when Alita beat up the robo thugs in the alley, she treated the threat seriously, not saying a word as she killed them. Because what we're supposed to get out of this situation is that if she did anything more or less, she and Ito were dead. And Captain Marvel? <laughs> Is that even supposed to be funny? Or is it supposed to make the enemies non-threatening? I'm being a little harsh. There are some good comedic bits in Captain Marvel, like when Carol knuckle fucks an old lady in the face on a crowded train and the passengers just go, oh. I'm ready. Oh! 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 World star that, my nigga. Or how about when Carol kills some passengers by blasting a hole through the roof of the car they're in? I like that. Or how about when they were checking out alien penises? Good shit. Captain Marvel doesn't get any, so I'm including this section to harp on harpies who think that's a good thing. Maybe I'm just a sap, but romance in these kinds of stories is usually a boon. And why? Because it raises the stakes. If your protagonist has a love interest, they have that much more to gain and that much more to lose. I'm not saying romance is necessary for or enhances every story. <laughs> Nope. Or even that Captain Marvel would have benefited from shoehorning it in. But why is Carol the lone hero singled out to be a spinster, while every other core Avenger got some sugar in their origin movies? What has happened historically with female protagonists is we will define them in terms of who they love or who loves them. And it's usually about a man, then everything is in relation to the man, and about whether or not he will give her validity. Sure, like in Alita, where loving a man supplied the female protagonist with more and stronger motivations, making her a better character. I can't really say the romance between Alita and Hugo was great. If anything, it was overdone, yet really undercooked. But Alita losing her husbando still tug at the heartstrings a little. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> Who did Carol have? You know, in lieu of any love interest. A friend she didn't remember? A S.H.I.E.L.D. agent she barely knew? And mentors she ended up not knowing at all? Pathetic. <laughs> to round this video out, let's take a gander at Rotten Tomatoes. See how the masses are leaning. Hey, people like Alita. Critics weren't as receptive. Told ya, it's alright. How about Marvel? Ouch. The people didn't like that one as much. Well, maybe it's being review bombed by the man babies. Let's see about on opening day. Damn. At 10k people too. Well, I chose the last snapshot. Maybe he was doing slightly better earlier in the day. Hmm, guess not. Hey, wait a minute. Why is there an extra 50k here? What? Eh, probably a glitch or something. Has to be. Because, I mean, if they're willing to rewrite history on the numbers for some silly comic book movie, imagine what other numbers could they be lying about.